Imagine there is a huge crevice right under your house. What would you do? Probably pick up your belongings and evacuate the structure. This is what happened to one Kenyan back in 2018. A massive crevice formed almost overnight under his home. The man escaped to safety, but the event revealed a deeper issue. Much deeper than most people thought. The crevice appeared after a month of heavy rainfall. This part of the country, west of the Kenyan capital of Nairobi, sits in a seismically active region. The massive hole in the ground was covered with ash from a nearby dormant volcano. The crevice in the ground ran for miles, and it was 65 feet wide in some places. It was as deep as the Hollywood sign is tall. The gaping hole damaged a vital local road. People soon dubbed it the Grand Canyon. But this is no laughing matter. The same thing happened in 2023. Kenya's highway authority had to close the busy road for repairs once again. Preliminary reports showed that heavy rains were the likeliest cause. The rupture itself is part of the Great Rift Valley. It extends from Jordan in the north to Mozambique in eastern Africa. Its total length is nearly one and a half times the distance from New York to Los Angeles. Rift valleys are located all over the planet. They're lowland places where tectonic plates move apart or rift. These are huge slabs of rock in Earth's outermost layer. They rest on molten rock underneath, which makes them unstable. Tectonic plates are constantly on the move. They can bump into each other or one plate can go under another. This can occur both on land and at the bottom of the ocean. Continental rifts are less frequent than the ones we find underwater. The East African Rift is one of four major ones. The nearby Arabian Plate has been on the move for the last 30 million years. When it separated from the African mainland, it created the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. When you look at the physical map of Africa, it looks like one contiguous landmass. But when you dig deeper, quite literally, you realize it rests on two tectonic plates. The Nubian one carries most of the continent. The smaller Somali plate holds the Horn of Africa. The crevice in Kenya appeared in the rift valley between these two plates. That's because they're moving away from each other. The rift is growing larger, which means that one day the African continent will split into two. The rifting process is a slow one. The present rate is just a quarter of an inch every year. Scientists estimate that the split will occur in 5 to 10 million years. Some experts place this event 50 million years into the future. The end result will be two African subcontinents. They will be separated by a body of water that will become our planet's sixth ocean. This also means that five now landlocked countries will get access to the sea. When they get a coastline, the countries could build harbors to trade with the rest of the world. Three other countries, including Kenya, would find themselves on two continents. The future split of Africa into two parts might sound dramatic at first, but it wouldn't be unnatural. This is the first time, after hundreds of millions of years, that the shape of Earth would change so much. The last time this happened was during the Jurassic period. If you're now thinking of Steven Spielberg's 1993 blockbuster movie, you're right! The world of dinosaurs had a different shape than the one we're familiar with today. There was a supercontinent called Gondwana. It included today's South America, Antarctica, India, Africa, Arabia, Madagascar, and Australia. Then, around 180 million years ago, things started to change. Earth was starting to take its familiar shape. The Indian subcontinent collided with the Asian mainland. The event gave rise to the Himalayan mountain range. These are the highest mountains in the world, with 30 peaks over 24,000 feet in altitude. This process is far from over. The Himalayas are still growing in height. On the other side of Gondwana, Africa and South America first separated together. But they weren't meant to last long. 40 million years later, South America started drifting away from Africa. This created the South Atlantic Ocean. 
the evidence of this ancient continental drift is obvious to this day. If you look at the map of South America, you'll notice a bulge in its eastern part. That's the modern country of Brazil. On the other side of the Atlantic, Africa has a huge inland curve on its western side. The two act as pieces of a giant jigsaw puzzle. They roughly fit into one another. European scientists noticed this as early as the 17th century. Further research confirmed the theory that South America and Africa once belonged to the same landmass. This is only one part of the story. At the beginning of the 20th century, a German scientist came up with the theory of continental drift. He believed that all of Earth's continents were once part of a supercontinent called Pangaea. The name comes from Greek, and it means all of the Earth. Makes sense, doesn't it? It was surrounded by the oceanic ancestor of the Pacific Ocean. Some 200 million years ago, this gigantic landmass was home to many animal and plant species. Thanks to them, scientists could piece together what our planet used to look like. For example, Mesosaurus was a giant freshwater reptile that existed during the Cretaceous period. Paleontologists found its fossils in only two places, Africa and South America. The animal lived in fresh water, so there was no way it could have swam in the Atlantic Ocean. This pointed to the fact that it lived in a single habitat, rich in rivers and lakes. This would have been possible in only one scenario. The two continents that are now miles apart were once a single piece of land. Pangaea wasn't the only supercontinent in Earth's history. Continents came together and drifted apart several times throughout our planet's past. Researchers know of at least three times this happened. Panodia formed 600 million years ago. Rodinia was an even older supercontinent. It existed a billion years ago. The driving force behind all these changes was tectonic activity. Plates deep beneath our feet have the ability to create new land and oceans. This is what's happening in East Africa right now. This activity is most evident at the bottom of the sea. Molten rock rises from deep within the earth to create new seafloor. The process is called seafloor spreading. It happens along underwater mountains called ridges. One example is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I think you can fairly accurately guess its location. Over time, the seafloor grows wider here. This has an effect on the continents on both sides of the ridge. Seafloor spreading causes continents to move away from each other. Right now, North America is moving away from Europe at a rate of one inch per year. This doesn't seem like much, but give it 50 million years and the Americas are gonna bump into the western part of Asia. The two landmasses will form a new supercontinent. Geologists from Yale University have a name for this land, Amasia. Talk about rushing before the ore. They ran a series of computer simulations to see what Earth would look like millions of years from now. The new continent is likely going to form somewhere around the North Pole. But don't go shopping for winter clothes just yet. The time frame for this event might extend to 200 million years into the future. We've all heard of the Sahara. Sure you have. It's the largest hot desert on the planet. A sea of sand covering an area larger than the contiguous United States. But have you ever wondered what lies beneath the sand dunes? To answer this question, we must travel deep into the past of our blue planet. Up until some 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was grassland. Humans were around at this time, not me, spreading agriculture around the planet. In the north of Africa, the color green dominated. Plenty of rainfall meant that there were lakes, rivers, pastures, and even forests. A completely different image of the Sahara from the barren landscape of today. But then, the climate started to shift. The region became parched, and the vegetation started disappearing. The wind did the rest. It took away the fine sediment after there were no plant roots to hold the ground together. Give it a couple thousands of years, and you get a familiar image of the Sahara. Sand and rocks stretching as far as the eye can see. 
But when it comes to volume, only a quarter of the Sahara is actually sand. The yellow sands of the Sahara are just one part of the story. The desert has many other features, such as gravel plains, salt flats, and plateaus. Makes you think if we understand the word desert correctly. For people who study such terrains, geologists, there is only one condition for defining a desert – precipitation. If an area gets little or no rain, then it's considered a desert. The Sahara certainly fits the bill. Its average annual rainfall is just 3 inches. Compare that to the nearly 45 inches a year in New York. When we look at precipitation, this sandy desert is only the third largest in the world. Number one and two are Antarctica and the Arctic. They are larger than the Sahara by millions of square miles. It sounds odd, but there is more than one type of desert. The first two are polar deserts, while the Sahara is a subtropical desert. But the difference in air temperature are staggering. In Antarctica's interior, temperatures plummet to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that to the highest temperature on record in the Sahara of 136 degrees Fahrenheit. But this desert has a cool side. At night, the temperature is roughly the same as the average yearly temperature in Denmark. This hot and cold roller coaster makes it hard to choose the right outfit when venturing into the Sahara. And what about the sand? How deep is it actually? The depth varies between 70 and 140 feet. That's not too deep. If you put the Statue of Liberty in a tall dune, half of it would still stick out of the sand. Its vast amounts in the Sahara were created by aeolian processes – that's Greek for wind. Over time, it blows and shapes the surface of the Earth. In dry areas with sparse vegetation, winds erode the ground much faster. That's what happened in North Africa. Under all that sand is the bedrock and cracked clay. If you started digging, you would find the same everywhere on the planet, with one important difference. There is some type of soil covering the bedrock. This is not the case in the Sahara. Because of the arid climate and a lack of vegetation, sand covers the ground below. Over the course of thousands of years, a lot of interesting finds ended up in the desert sand. For example, there are petrified tree trunks. These are essentially preserved prehistoric trees. They date back to the time when the region was lush green. In some places, the trees of this fossilized forest are at least 65 feet tall. The wood is so well preserved that you can still see the texture and knots. There are even fossilized pine cones. In 1992, scientists found glass fragments in eastern Sahara. These canary yellow glass shards were scattered across hundreds of miles. They didn't belong to an ancient civilization. Although ancient Egyptians used them to make jewelry. In fact, the breastplate of King Tut had a beautiful scarab beetle centerpiece made from this desert glass. For a long time, scientists were puzzled about the true origins of these fragments. They finally concluded that the glass was around 29 million years old. It is an impact type. If that sounds like it has something to do with the word impact, you are correct. These rocks are formed when a meteorite hits the surface of the Earth. This generates a lot of heat. Scientists estimate that the temperature needed to melt this mineral was close to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apart from the regular fine-grained sand, we also have melted sand in the Sahara. But the desert conceals other unlikely artifacts. Shark teeth are a common find in Morocco, which sits in the western part of the Sahara. What are the fossilized teeth of these marine predators doing in the middle of the desert? This part of the world looked entirely different millions of years ago. There was a sea cutting right through what is now a desert. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran the length of present-day Algeria and Mali. It was around 165 feet deep. That was enough for all sorts of aquatic animals to inhabit it. Large catfish, sea snakes, and of course sharks lived in the area. British archaeologists even unearthed a turtle shell in Mali in the 1980s. For centuries, there was even an entire city hidden under the desert. Timgad was a Roman outpost constructed by the Emperor Trajan around the year 100 in the current era. 
for various reasons, its residents abandoned it around the year 700. The sands of the Sahara soon engulfed the city. It had remained hidden for nearly a thousand years. Then, in the 1700s, a Scottish explorer started digging out the city. His team first uncovered a sandstone triumphal arch 40 feet high, similar to the ones we can see in Rome and Paris today. An amphitheater soon popped out of the sand, and it was followed by well-preserved statues of Roman emperors. The Scotsman's find was so impressive that no one believed him at first. It took two more centuries for archaeologists to fully excavate the city during the 1950s. The site covers a surface as large as 10 polo fields. The ruins reveal the full mastery of Roman city planning. All the streets meet at a right angle, in what is known as an orthogonal grid. You can find the same layout in modern cities such as New York. Historians estimate that during its heyday, 10,000 people called Timgad home. Different nationalities lived here, from Romans to people of African descent. Today, more than 2.5 million people live in and around the Sahara. They are spread across 11 countries in total, and their living space is growing. The desert is 10% larger than it was just a century ago. This process doesn't involve sand pouring out of the Sahara. The ecosystems on the edges of the desert simply change over time. The wind blows the soil away and vegetation dwindles, the perfect conditions for the formation of a desert landscape. These changes are happening in the Sahel, a region south of the Sahara Desert. That's why the African countries have recently come together for a project called the Great Green Wall. The primary goal is to stop the desertification of the Sahel and hold back the sands of the Sahara. Their plan is ambitious and involves planting a wall of trees from the west to the east of the African continent. The proposed forest is not only going to be long, but wide as well. The Sahara and the Sahel share a historic bond. Since antiquity, camel caravans have been making the journey from Africa's Mediterranean coast in the north to the savannas in the south. The golden age of this trade kicked off in the 9th century. The perilous journey took several months to complete. The route was two and a half times longer than the length of the Grand Canyon. Explorers still find evidence of these ancient caravans hidden away under the sands of the Sahara. You plan to spend your summer vacation in Africa. The final destination is the Sahara Desert. It's located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. You're excited to ride camels and learn about the region's rich cultures. You hop on an extensively long flight, and finally, you are here. You find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Can you believe it's 3 million square miles? You're ready for your first adventure after drinking liters of ice-cold water. The guide gives you a choice. You can spend two weeks visiting a collection of oases, or you can help them solve an ongoing local mystery. Deep into the desert, near this Algerian town, lies a mystery begging to be solved. A collection of huge, spotted circles in the sand. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles in a straight line. The circles were first identified via Google Earth images several years ago. People have debated them for years, but no one seems to know the answer. The strange thing is that they are so many miles away from any towns, roads, or human activity. The quickest way to discover the truth behind the circles is asking questions. You grab your notebook and set up to talk to locals. Everyone is helpful in this scenario – geographers, anthropologists, elders, and historians. The first person you talk to is a map expert. You need to understand if those circles were authentic or a satellite glitch. You end up interviewing the people who take Google Earth satellite pictures. The circles are really there. They appear in multiple pictures from many years. Then, let's understand why they are there in the first place. After two days of interviews, you have your first lead. The circles could be the result of oil activity. Experts explained why this would make sense. Algeria is a rich area for natural resources, so this would be a sensible guess. Usually, to find out if there is anything worth extracting, companies would undertake seismic surveys. 
Seismic surveys are a way of analyzing the Earth's surface by sending shock waves into the ground. Depending on how these waves bounce back, you'll know what is located there. A special vehicle could have marked the soil that way. So, did we unravel the mystery? Mm, not quite so. As you know, the Sahara Desert is one of the driest areas on the planet. The average high temperatures in summer are over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. To survive there, people need to find ways of accessing water. So, these circles could be a kind of ruin or leftovers from ancient water wells. Again, I'd say this is a sensible guess. Ready for some fact-checking? Some anthropologists agree that these circles could be ancient fogueras. Fogera is the name of a 2,500-year-old style of irrigation system, usually found in northern Africa. It is also known as a kanat in other places in northern Africa. Locals would dig a deep well at an elevated point, deep enough to tap into underground water. They would then dig parallel shafts at regular distances. Then, they would dig an underground channel that connected the city to the well. Solely with the help of gravity, water would run from the well to the city. This traditional technology provided water for crops, livestock, and humans. Now, let's say these wells made human-made oases possible. Even the closest municipality name was an indication that this could be true. The name Fogaret Esaoia is actually named after Fogarets, these ancient wells. Now, this lead was proving to be very accurate. You decide to travel over there to see for yourself. You take a local bus, sit back, and enjoy the ride. The landscape in northern Algeria is filled with ancient-looking towns. You even see ruins of wells along the way, on the outskirts of smaller cities. Opening Google satellite images, you can see the Kanat's markings on the ground, a series of holes running down several miles. But as soon as you arrive, you find out you were wrong. Dale Lightfoot, one of the world's leading experts on Kanat's, said that the circles were definitely not Kanat's. Even the satellite images confirm this difference. Uh-oh, we were so close! Apparently, Kanats or Fagras would not run down a straight line. They wouldn't be shaped like circles. Another clue that this wasn't the case was that there were no towns at the end. The circles were really far away from any human activity, and Kanats were explicitly built to provide water for human settlements. Well, it sure was a good try. You almost gave up on this mystery when you decided to take one more field trip. It was days of preparation pick up cars, food, equipment, all so that the mystery of the Sahara circles could be unraveled. On the first day, you drove over 99 miles into the desert. You were always curious to see what this part of the world looked like. Over there, you see nothing but mustard yellow dunes. The night sky is pretty decent, though. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. You set up camp and sleep under a canopy of stars. The next day, tension grows. There's no cell reception. Oh dear. But thankfully, you added the coordinates of the circles to your Google map. And surprise, the offline mode works out there. You follow the coordinates, but it leads you astray. You start to get nervous, thinking this was all in vain. But you and the team get into the car and drive a few more miles past the coordinates on your phone. After a very bumpy ride, you can't believe your eyes. There it is! An enormous crater dug on the sand, surrounded by 12 smaller holes. From up high, it looks like a clock. Without the pointers, of course. On the ground, they're very faint. So faint, you almost miss them. Searching the area, you notice all the holes had something similar. Metal wires. Thin wires that you can pull from the ground. They're buried deep, so you start digging. An object starts to reveal itself. Uh-oh! It looks like old dynamite. This certainly surprises you. Um, better stop digging to avoid any accidents. At the end of the survey, you feel satisfied, but still curious. What could all this dynamite mean? And who put it there? What comes next is the turning point of your adventure. Walking back to the car, you see something shining on the ground. You approach the item with curiosity. It's round and rusty and looks like a sardine can. What's that doing here? Could this give you more clues about the circle's mystery? Just in case, you pick it up and put it in the car. 
Back in the city, the puzzle pieces start to reveal the story behind the Sahara circles. You bring photos in the sardine can and show them to local experts. They analyze your material and give you an intriguing verdict. As it turns out, guess number one was the closest one to the truth. So, what happened to the first guess? Why do we need to keep digging deeper? Well, because it was only half right. The Sahara circles are not a historical footprint of seismic surveying. Back when the circles were made, this technology didn't even exist. But they sure are related to oil exploration. The dynamite-filled holes were an old method for oil searching. The circles are the leftovers of surveyors looking for resources underground. And the sardine cans? Well, they were left by the workers who held explosion works. You gotta eat, right? According to the model of the can, this happened more or less around the 1950s and 1960s. So these circles aren't even that ancient. More like modern ones, if you ask me. Well, well, well. Hope you are glad you tagged along and helped unravel this mystery. See you in the next mystery-solving adventure. You find yourself in Africa, land of unique wildlife, home to a great variety of cultures and languages, and, first and foremost, host to the world's largest hot desert, the Sahara. It's daytime, and you are thirsty for some water and shade. You've been walking for days, trying to find one of those precious-looking oases. You feel you're near, but the horizon just keeps stretching and stretching. Your mind is tired, and your body is feeling all the heat. It's like you've eaten a full plate of hot pepper and then some more, judging by how much you're sweating. And when I say hot, think 100 degrees Fahrenheit hot on average. No wonder this is happening. After all, you find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Now I say hot desert since the biggest deserted landscapes are actually the cold ones, located in Antarctica and the Arctic. I see Antarctica's frozen desert is more or less the size of 1 million LAXs. Yep, the Los Angeles International Airport. The Arctic Desert is just a bit smaller than that. Now, in case you don't know, the Sahara Desert is located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Red Sea. It occupies an area large enough to place approximately 100,000 Disney World theme parks side by side. According to scientists, its boundaries are expanding. Deserts usually form in the subtropics because of what's called Hadley circulation. The air rises at the equator and descends into the subtropics. This circulation of air has a drying effect, which helps the formation of desert landscapes. Since the 1920s, the Sahara is considered to have expanded by over 10%. How is this happening? Well, let's start from the beginning. You probably know the Sahara Desert as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth today. Just FYI, for a place to be considered a desert, it has to receive less than 4 inches of rain per year. Due to the very small precipitation index, deserts are usually dry and arid places. There is little humidity in the air, and daytime temperatures can go as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, there isn't that much animal and plant life because of the lack of water. But in the Sahara's case, it wasn't always like that. It may be difficult to imagine northern Africa without the tons of sand it has today. But about 20,000 years ago, the Sahara was actually one big oasis. Recent discoveries show clear evidence of what the scientists now call the Green Sahara. In the mid-1800s, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered some paintings and engravings that nomad artists had left behind. What he saw in those paintings looked nothing like his actual surroundings. Instead of an arid landscape with only camels and desert vegetation, the rock paintings depicted jungle animals like giraffes and hippos. There were even images of livestock and grazing animals such as cattle and sheep, something that seems impossible for modern-day Sahara. Artists usually draw what they see around them, so this finding really intrigued the German explorer. The drawings were so detailed that the artist must have had close contact with those animals. You can find this rock art spread out in the northern part of the African continent, from Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia. Geologists soon took a keen interest in this and found the first clues to what this could mean. They have been able to confirm that, in fact, northern Africa was once much wetter. They found evidence from nearby deep-sea sediment off the coast of Mauritania. 
sampled cores of underwater sand and mud, known as Saharan dust flux, show geologists that, indeed, a green Sahara was possible. The more dust is blowing off of the desert and into the bottom of the ocean, the drier the climate in the region. The sediment cores show that there was much less dust, only half as much, coming off northern Africa during the humid period. This period has to do with Earth's natural cycles. Normally, the Earth rotates at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. But this angle is not consistent and changes over time. Earth's tilt is responsible for the amount of sunlight each hemisphere receives. It affects several ecosystem functions on the planet. During the time of the Green Sahara, the Earth received between 4 and 8% more sunlight than it does today. So when the Earth tilted about 20,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere received more direct sunlight, which affected humidity levels in the region. As the northern hemisphere got warmer, this affected monsoon activity. More specifically, the West African monsoon. Monsoons are wind systems that affect a region's rainfall index and humidity levels. As a part of the globe gets warmer, it allows for more air to rise. It combines with the wind to draw moisture up into the atmosphere. Little by little, northern Africa also became wetter. The increased moisture made the Sahara so wet that there were actual bodies of water in the region. As vegetation grew, the plants held on to moisture better than bare sand could. There is evidence of natural basins throughout the Sahara and lakes so big they would fit all of the U.S.'s Great Lakes inside of them. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of vibrant societies in what are now arid areas. It looks like ancient cultures were able to take full advantage of the African humid period. According to researchers, the human population peaked across the Sahara about 9,000 years ago. There are traces of fireplaces, hunting tools, fish hooks, and even mounds of fish bones. Records show that there have been over 230 green periods over the span of 8 million years. Solar radiation is always changing due to natural orbital cycles. That's why Earth will most certainly see another green Sahara moment. It might be thousands of years from now, but it will happen. The same way the Sahara turns green, it turns yellow again. Let's put it like that. All it takes is a significant axial tilt and a few years of readjusting. However, another phenomenon is calling the attention of scientists now. Recent studies by the National Science Foundation from the University of Maryland show the Sahara has expanded 10% over the past 90 years. This phenomenon is called desertification, which literally means fertile land turning into desert land. The Sahara Desert is now advancing into the semi-arid region of Sahel. In 1950, this region was home to 31 million people. Today, its population is over 100 million people. This rapid population growth has largely contributed to the Sahara's expansion. Farmers that were once nomads began settling down. Land usage grew more intense, aiding in weakening the soil. The demand for food has caused an overcropping of the land, so even more of it is turning into the desert now. The study also shows that natural climate cycles can affect rainfall in the Sahara and the Sahel. Scientists affirm that all deserts fluctuate, not only the Sahara. A desert's boundary may expand in the dry winter and contract during the wetter summer. South of the Sahara lies the Chad Basin. It is a natural body of water that now serves as an indicator of the Sahara's expansion. The Chad Basin is located in the region where the Sahara is advancing southward. An atmospheric and ocean expert from the University of Maryland explains that rainfall has reduced greatly in the entire region. Due to reduced rainfalls, there is less water across the entire basin, and even Chad Lake is drying out. Just like the Sahara, the Atacama Desert in Chile, deemed the world's driest, is also expanding. It is located north of the city of Santiago, and its southern border is expanding toward the Chilean capital. Because the climate is getting drier and drier here, the city of Santiago is turning into an arid or semi-arid region itself. The once fertile valleys of local rivers that lived on agriculture and livestock for many generations are losing their revenues as Chilean land is turning into a desert. Since 2010, Santiago has received only a third of its annual rainfall. Outside of the city, farmers are digging holes in search of blue gold, or simply put, water. The situation here is very similar to that of Sahel. So tell me this. 
Were you as surprised as I was to find out what has been happening in the Sahara region? Feel free to share in the comments below. Mirror check. You've got your beige parka on, your chisel is packed, and your overnight plane ride to Saudi Arabia is booked. You know what this means, right? Unfortunately, you weren't cast in the remake of Dune. It just means that you're ready to go explore the world's largest desert areas in the hopes of uncovering prehistoric secrets about our ancestors. Let's get one thing straight. If you ever thought that deserts were empty spaces, think again. They might be filled with sand as far as the eye can see, but they also hold a lot of history. You know, because before humans settled down in cities and towns, we were nomadic people, and we traveled all around the globe looking for food, water, and shelter. So we had to come up with some interesting stuff to survive. Like this thing that was found in the desert of Saudi Arabia. Do you have any idea what this could have been? Over many years, scientists have discussed the origins and use of huge structures such as these ones. It seems our Neolithic ancestors were way smarter than we gave them credit for. They didn't spend all their hours around the fire carving weapons out of stone. No, they were also practicing their architectural skills. These huge stone structures are called desert kites. Because if you look at them from a distance, well, they sort of look like kites. Archaeologists have arrived at the consensus that these kites were used to lure animals in. This way, it would make it easier for our ancestors to guarantee their week's food. But that's not all. Take a look at these monolithic structures right here. They show us that our ancestors probably drew on rocks, the blueprint of what they were going to build on the ground. Just like modern-day architects, desert kites could be miles long, so they drew out a plan before actually building them. The most surprising feature of all is that these kites were built even before things such as Stonehenge. We're talking around 7,000 to 9,000 years ago. Over the last decade, scientists have been able to identify over 6,000 desert kites spread across the Middle East and West and Central Asia. If you don't think this huge, try building something this large without the help of any drones. It looks like a pretty difficult feat to me. And apparently, Saudi Arabia's desert is filled with more amazing things. Scientists have found mysterious stone structures that are older than the pyramids of Giza in Egypt. So, of course, you can't wait to go check that out. Can we all agree that carrying around heavy rocks to build a pyramid without the help of modern technology sounds absurd? I mean, how on earth did they do it? Now imagine turning back the clock about 2,000 years into the past and finding humans that built similar gigantic structures in isolated areas. Take a look at these so-called mustadles. They are rectangular structures built from piled up stones, found over 77,000 square miles. Some archaeologists believe that these monuments were used for ritualistic purposes, maybe processions of some kind, where people would walk from one end of the plateau to the other. I'd be down for that. Now let's move on to another deserted area. We're entering the world-famous Sahara Desert landscape. Isn't it beautiful? Here, you're about to unravel an ancient mystery, something that took years for researchers to solve. Fun fact, the Sahara Desert is the world's largest hot desert. It spans over three million square miles, which would be like putting a thousand times the country of Hawaii next to each other. We say it's the largest hot desert because the world's largest desert area is Antarctica. But we all know temperatures over there are freezing, not the typical image of when we think of a desert. Deep into the desert, near the Algerian town of Fogaret at Zua, something strange was found. For decades, these tiny dots appeared on images of Google Earth, but nobody could explain what they were. Some scientists were sure that these circles are the result of oil activity in the region. Others guessed that these were ancient fogaras or ancient water wells, there are dozens of them, stretching for miles and miles in a straight line. The strange thing is that they are always far away from any town, road, or human activity in general. So what was or is their purpose? If you had to take a guess, what would you say? Remember we talked about how our ancestors had to be creative in order to survive in the desert? Let's try to walk in their shoes for a minute. Imagine you're a nomadic hunter-gatherer living in a desert area. You spend your days basking in the hot sun, trying to count all the grains of sand around you. But you also need to eat and drink water. But how on earth do you get water in a desert? Sure, you can hope to keep running into oasis every week or so, but that seems a bit risky, doesn't it? That's why North African people invented the so-called fogaras. The fogaras are a 2,500-year-old irrigation system. 
Locals would dig deep wells in elevated areas, wells deep enough to tap into underground water. Then, they would dig parallel shafts at regular distances. This way, the water would flow from the main well down into all the shafts and irrigate entire areas. Travelers could stop by the shafts and quench their thirst. They could also raise livestock and tend to crops. Pretty clever, huh? As much as these holes did look like Fogaris, a little bit of research would show you that they're not. You see, these shafts were built in a line and not in a circular shape like the ones we're looking at now. So maybe it has something to do with the second option? Maybe these desert holes were related to oil activity in the region? Let's have a look at the holes up close and personal. From Google Earth, they don't seem that big, but in real life, they are huge craters. The tip to uncovering what they are is hidden beneath the sand. If you were one of the researchers originally uncovering the truth behind this mystery, you would have found something unique hidden in the sand. Old dynamites and vintage sardine cans. Putting the pieces of the puzzle together, scientists found that these sardine cans were a model from the 1950s and 1960s. It seems that entire teams from that decade would camp out while they surveyed the area for oil. And what about the dynamites? These were used for seismic surveying. This is an old technique used to identify if there is oil and gas beneath the Earth's surface. Still in North Africa, you find out about another desert mystery worth exploring. Near the city of Tiaret, southwest of Algeria's capital, one runs into 13 peculiar monuments. These structures are also called Jedars, and yes, I am aware of how much that may sound like a Star Wars reference. They are pyramid-like in their shapes, and as far as scientists know, they were used as final resting places for the people who lived in the region. Can you guess who these were? most likely the Berber nomads. And since we're talking about ancient stuff, they were probably built between the 4th and 7th centuries CE. Once scientists began to explore the insides of these monuments, they found they were pretty big inside. They found large underground vaults, chambers, and labyrinth-like corridors that gave way to over 20 compartments. It could take you up to two hours to walk around in them, and apparently our ancestors also used its walls to depict images of animals and hunting scenes. There's no definite proof of what these Jadars were used for, though. This is so neat, huh? I'm sure that our world's desert is filled with many more mysterious things for us to unravel. I guess I'll see you next time so that we can continue our... Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the jumping cholla, or teddy bear cholla. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping cholla and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself, along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. 
the next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still. There's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Salpigid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania, under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. 
If you really need it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whipped scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona Bark Scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. Phew! This summer has been turning up the heat like never before. We feel like roasted marshmallows on a sizzling grill. Yes, the world is getting hotter, but some regions have always fought with high temperatures. It turns out people had some inventions to keep themselves cool in ancient times too. Some of them are still functioning, even 3,000 years later. Let's take a look at how people saved themselves from heat throughout history. So, put an ice cube into your cold drink and get ready to hear how people survived the heat. Speaking of ice cubes, do you know that the Persians made an ice storage system? In the deserts of ancient Persia, people had an out-of-the-box idea about how to prevent their food from turning into a melted mess. These ingenious Persians stumbled upon a physics trick that allowed them to create ice in the middle of the desert. They called these cool structures yakchals, which basically means ice pits. These ice pits were not your ordinary coolers. They were like secret underground fridges. They looked like dome-shaped mud brick structures on the outside, but inside, it was a whole different world. These ice pits had an evaporation cooler system that worked like magic. At night, when the desert cooled down, Persians made use of the radiative cooling effect. They set up cleverly designed trenches to hold thin layers of water. The water froze, defying the desert heat. Then there were underground square storage areas. The Persians collected the melting ice water from these cool trenches, and during the night, they froze it again making the most of the desert's natural chill. To add to the cooling effect, they built a wall to shade the storage areas from the hot midday sun. And that's not all. They had this fantastic wind-catching contraption called a badger that caught the breeze and directed it right into the ice pits. Fresh air plus ice. Cool breeze. A winning combo. They even had intricate water channels called kanats to bring water to the ice pits and homes all the way from the nearby mountains. As time passed, these yakchals faded into history and modern technology took over. But hey, there's good news too. Some awesome folks in Iran are restoring these ancient coolers. So, if you ever find yourself in the desert, don't forget to pay a visit to these marvelous places and witness the genius of the ancient Persians firsthand. Now, I want to focus more on the wind catchers because they don't just help make ice cubes. They actually function as a cooling system as well. Back in the day, those clever architectural wonders were all the rage in places like Persia, modern-day Iran, Egypt, and the Middle East. Imagine tower-like structures with openings at various levels strategically placed to harness the power of nature's breeze. These openings were like magical portals for the wind. They captured those refreshing gusts and guided them right into people's living spaces. Basically, they were natural air conditioners. The breeze would gracefully flow downward, cooling the ground as it danced through the building. The secret sauce lies in the details. 
The tower's height, the number of sides, the openings, and the positioning of the interior blades, everything plays its role in how efficiently the wind towers work out. Thanks to these wind catchers, ancient societies could enjoy comfy indoor temperatures without sweating. Can you imagine living in those times? Feeling the gentle breeze whisking through your home, keeping you feeling fresh and chilled out? The Persians are often credited for inventing these awesome wind catchers. But hey, don't forget about Egypt. There, you can find traces of similar structures dating all the way back to 1300 BCE. Yes, the invention of wind catchers may have occurred in ancient Egypt, but Yazid in Iran is the city with the largest number of wind catchers. People wouldn't have been able to live there without these ancient ACs because there was almost no rain in the area throughout the year. Now, let's look at these perforated double-skinned exteriors. Imagine dressing up a building with a fancy perforated screen. It's like giving its exterior a stylish makeover while keeping things chill inside. This genius technique, firstly, scatters the natural daylight, so no harsh sunbeams to blind you. The screen also offers shade like a pro, giving the building's interior a much needed break from the blazing sun. Think of it as a natural sun hat for your home. Placing this screen about four feet away from the outer walls creates a breezy, dreamy hallway for fresh air circulation. And hey, they add a touch of elegance to the building too. These structures are sometimes called Jali. Jaipur, India, for example, has an average daytime temperature of about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So these structures are lifesavers. Jalis come in various forms, crafted from cement, earth, and wood. It's a cultural symbol deeply embedded in Indian architecture. You can find its captivating presence in iconic historical buildings like the majestic Taj Mahal and the Grand Red Fort in Delhi. But hey, it's not just a thing of the past. It's still rocking modern architecture scenes and its charm has sparked creativity in artists and designers worldwide. It adorns the building's exterior, its cross-section showing a larger opening on the outside and a smaller one on the inside. This is where the Venturi effect steps in to show off its physics prowess. As the air flows through the narrowing passage, it picks up speed, creating a difference in pressure between the inside and outside of the building. Air blowing at a higher speed gets compressed, and when released, it cools down. Mashrabia is a wooden lattice or screen used in the Middle East and North Africa. These decorative wonders are like window blinds, but they do more than just look pretty. They're smart too. They give privacy, shading you from the sun, and let fresh air and light in. Some people also add clay pots filled with water, sand, or damp straw to their designs. As hot air breezes through the holes, it also passes through the pot's porous surface. The moisture inside evaporates, cooling the air. This is a perfect low-cost technique for hot and dry climates. It's eco-friendly, and there's no need for electricity. Now, let's fast forward to today. Designers are getting creative, mixing traditional wisdom with modern tech. At the Al-Bahar Towers in Abu Dhabi, they've got it too. Picture over 2,000 hexagonal panels that dance with the sun's movement, providing shade to the building's interior. Water evaporation was another secret weapon for ancient people. Simple, yet super effective. Plus, ancient Egyptians hung wet mats and curtains in doorways. When the air passed through them, it cooled down, providing a relief from the scorching sun. Ancient architects were the masters of maximizing airflow. They knew how to cross-ventilate and let hot air escape while inviting cooler air to the party. Speaking of ancient Rome, bathhouses were the place to be back then. It was like a community hub. People gathered to chat about politics, play sports, and, of course, take a relaxing dip. The Frigidarium was the cool spot in Roman baths. After a steamy soak in the Caldarium, Romans dashed to this giant pool to chill out. Then in some places, like Cappadocia in Turkey, people went underground to hide from the heat. They carved cozy dwellings in volcanic rock, 
harnessing the Earth's natural cooling powers. So the lesson here is simple. Architects and designers can create wonders by combining local traditions with smart tech. California's Death Valley boasts the highest officially registered temperature to date, with 134 degrees Fahrenheit in 1913. Meanwhile, Africa's sweltering record stands at 131 degrees Fahrenheit in Kebeli, Tunisia, as noted in 1931. In Europe, the highest temperature ever documented reached almost 120 degrees Fahrenheit in Sicily in August 2021. Then, in 2022, the UK had the hottest summer of all time. India could split horizontally into two parts as it runs into Eurasia. The movement of the Indian plate that includes most of modern South Asia is causing the Himalayas to grow. This process started around 60 million years ago when the plate first bumped into Eurasia. Scientists from the Netherlands have used the power of an AI simulator to see what this region will look like one day. The computer model showed that the Indian subcontinent will merge with the Horn of Africa in approximately 200 million years. The present-day cities of Mumbai and Mogadishu will become next-door neighbors. They will sit along the newly formed mountain chain scientists provisionally named the Somalaya. On the other side of this geological formation, Madagascar will connect with Sumatra, while Kolkata and the island of Meridius will occupy the same region. Sri Lanka would cease to exist as it becomes part of the Indian mainland. Further to the north, scientists predict that the Himalayas are going to increase in height in the foreseeable future. As the Indian plate continues to mile northward, there will be major changes to the surrounding landscape. The present fault line will drift further south. Tens of thousands of years in the future, there might be no Nepal. The Himalayan range will have expanded sideways to fully engulf the mountainous country. And there may be way more earthquakes in this part of the world because of this movement. Most researchers agree the speed at which India is moving northward into Eurasia is barely a tenth of an inch every year. Some of them think this is happening because of the plate's buoyancy. It prevents the Indian plate from sinking into the mantle, which gives Tibet its elevated topography. Other scholars believe that the structure is buckling under the pressure. The process resembles what happens to a sheet of paper when you push it horizontally against a wall. As you apply more pressure to its edge, the sheet starts to rise in the middle. In the real world, this bulge would be the Tibetan Plateau. A recent theory gives us the third explanation for the process. Their paper still has to undergo peer review, but the findings are intriguing. The international team of researchers introduced a new concept, the delamination of the Indian plate. This term simply means the separation of layers in a material that is supposed to be bonded together. Think of a sandwich that has cheese and ham slices between two buns. Take one of those layers out of the sandwich and you get delamination. In geological terms, this process involves the upper part of the plate peeling off and moving upwards. In the case of the Indian plate, this is the section that supports Tibet's elevation. The lower section is denser, which causes it to sink into the mantle. Plate tectonics are, in this way, similar to a layered cake. Chefs place the spongy, denser layer at the bottom, so the heavier top doesn't crush it. Scientists developed their thesis by analyzing helium gases in water samples from the region's hot springs. Helium-3 is a rare isotope that shows that the mantle is close to the surface of the Earth. Researchers measured helium isotope ratios at 200 Tibetan springs. The pattern they saw shows how close the mantle is to the northern Tibetan surface. Further to the south, they found plenty of helium-4, another isotope, which means that the plate is intact. It forms a barrier that helium-3 cannot penetrate except in one region near Bhutan, in the eastern part of the Himalayas. The seismic activity in the region is good proof that delamination, the sandwich theory, is all real here. And it shows us that the mantle is intruding from the eastern side of the plateau. This concept puts under question the old established ideas about tectonic plate behavior. 
The scientists behind the study suspect that the unique shape of the Indian plate contributes to the delamination process. It's the thickest at the northernmost point and the thinnest on the sides. If it's all true, it will mean that the continental collisions have a more dynamic and complex nature than geologists previously believed. Scientists still don't have enough hard evidence to prove the correctness of the new theory, just hints. Drilling to depths of over 60 miles is mechanically impossible right now. Such excavations are necessary to be 100% sure that the delamination process is going on. With the right technology, we would be able to better understand the hazards associated with earthquakes in the Asia-Pacific region. It's home to the famous Ring of Fire, where 75% of Earth's volcanoes are located. 9 out of 10 all earthquakes take place here. The India-Australia Capricorn tectonic plate beneath the Indian Ocean is also important for solving Earth's tectonic mysteries. The term geophysicists use for such locations is nascent plate boundary. These are plates where tectonic plates are just starting to pull apart or push against each other. They represent the initial stage of a full-fledged plate boundary. Such a geological transformation unfolds at a pace of barely 5% of a single inch per year. That's about as long as a strand of spaghetti is wide. This shouldn't worry us too much from today's perspective. The India-Australia Capricorn Plate is destined to split in half over the course of tens of millions of years. Scientists from France studied records of two earthquakes that happened in 2012 and concluded there must be a nascent boundary there. Earthquakes normally occur at places where two or more tectonic plates meet. But the tremors in the Indian Ocean happened in the middle of the plate. The scientists used sonar scanning to map out the sea floor and see what was really going on there. After further examination of the marine area off the coast of Western Australia, researchers found a complex network of 62 pull-apart basins along a fracture zone. The scientific data backed up the idea that the tectonic plate was slowly but surely breaking apart. It's another proof that the outer layer of our planet is dynamic not static. In some cases, you don't have to be a scientist to notice these powerful underground forces. Massive crevices emerged almost overnight due to heavy rainfall in a seismically active region in rural Kenya, first in 2018 and then again in 2023. The local population named the biggest of them the Grand Kenya. These events were not one-time incidents, but signals from the East African Rift System part of the Great Rift Valley. This huge geological phenomenon stretching from Jordan to Mozambique shows us the gradual splitting of the African continent into two subcontinents. You can find rift valleys all around the world as proof of how tectonic plate movements are changing the planet. The East African Rift shows the underlying dynamics of the Nubian and Somali plates. The Nubian plate bears most of Africa, and the smaller, Somali plate cradles the Horn of Africa. The two are gradually moving away from one another, which causes the formation of crevices within the rift valley. This process of continental rifting, going on at a rate slightly faster than the one in India, will eventually lead to the split of Africa into two continents. The whole process, which is about to happen in the next 10 to 50 million years, marks a significant geological event that reminds us of Earth's historical transformations. The last time our planet's geography changed so drastically was during the Jurassic period. The world map from the period looks recognizable, but the land masses were oddly positioned from the modern perspective. In the north, Eurasia was still loosely connected to North America, which was at the time called Laurasia. This landmass was slowly moving away from the supercontinent of Gondwana, further down south. It consisted of what we know today as Africa, South America, Australia, and Antarctica. At the time, the Indian plate was closer to Madagascar than to Eurasia, as it is today. 